first letter of St. John, God is love, and the one that abideth in love abideth in God, and God in them. Welcome everyone to this, our Sunday liturgy for July the 18th. This service coming out of the Book of Common Prayers morning prayer liturgy that some will be familiar with, uh, others may be a little bit less so. Uh, the sermon will be coming, as was traditional in that liturgy, at the very end of the service. And thank you in advance to Father Jerry for his message today. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God as we prepare our hearts for worship. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that we may turn from our wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. God pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe the Holy Gospel. Wherefore, we beseech God to grant us true repentance and the Holy Spirit, that those things may please the Lord which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy so that at the last we may come to God's eternal joy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall shall forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as, as it was in the beginning, is, is now, and ever, ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. We offer a, song, a portion of Psalm 65 as our morning song. Praise is due to thee, O God, in Zion. And unto thee shall the vow be performed in Jerusalem. Thou that hearest the prayer. Unto thee shall all flesh come. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou makest it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. Thou preparest their grain. For so thou providest for the earth. The pastures of the wilderness drip, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also stand so sick with grain that they laugh and sing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The first lesson is written in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, in the second chapter, beginning at the eleventh verse. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Jesus Christ, uh, Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law, the two, uh, the law with its commandments and its ordinances so that he might create for himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. But you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also are brought together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Here endeth the first blessing. And we offer up a portion of Psalm 89. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. My hand will hold him fast, and my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him, nor any wicked one bring him down. I will crush his foes before him, and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and love shall be with him, and he shall be victorious through my name. I shall make his dominion extend from the great sea to the river. He will say to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn, and higher than the rulers of the earth. I will keep my love for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his line forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and do not walk according to my judgments, if they break my statutes, and do not keep my commandments, I will punish their transgressions with a rod, 
and their iniquity is with the lash. But I will not take my love from them, nor let my faithfulness prove false. I will not break my covenant, nor change what has gone out of my lips. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His line shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall stand fast forevermore like the moon, the abiding witness in the sky. The second lesson is written in the Gospel of St. Mark in the sixth chapter, beginning at the 30th verse. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Genesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they, that they might touch even the fringe of his coat, cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Here ended the second lesson. O be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before the God's presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord is God. It is the Lord that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are God's people, and the sheep of God's pasture. O oh, go your way into the gates with thanksgiving, and into God's courts with praise. Be thankful unto the Lord, and speak good of God's name. For the Lord is gracious, whose mercy is everlasting. And God's truth endureth from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Christ, Christ have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And evermore mightily defend us. Will God make clean our hearts within us? And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Lord of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of thy name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness. And of thy great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, 
we humbly beseech thee to bless our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth, the Parliaments of the Commonwealth, and all who are set in authority under her, that they may order all things in wisdom, righteousness, and peace, to the honour of thy holy name, and the good of thy Church and people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, let us lift up in our prayers this day our Bishop Todd and the laity and clergy of our parish. In our parish cycle, we uphold this day Gail Croft in prayer. In our diocese, we're praying for Trinity, uh, St. James Church in Bayfield, uh, St. George's Church, Godridge, and Christ Church, Port Albert. We pray also for the Diocese of Calgary, it's Archbishop Greg Crew Wilson and the laity and clergy there. In the Synod of Alberta and the territories of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, uh, we pray for Reverend Prima Samuel, assistant to the bishop there. In the north, we pray for the Diocese of Saskatchewan, its laity and clergy and its bishops, uh, Michael Hawkins and Adam Halkett. Around the world, we're praying for the Anglican Church of Rwanda. So with all of them on our hearts, we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and clergy and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we continue to pray for Jason, Ellen, Danielle, Yvonne and Joe, Rob and Rita, Sue and Peter, Ron, Perry, Jeremy and Justin, Rudy, Heather, Leah, Iris, Nevin, Ilya and Anastasia, Wayne, Luke, Mike, Rebecca, Shaylin, Jess, James, Debbie, Ian, Alex, Joshua, Marilyn, Rebecca, Tom, Melanie, Louise, Lynn, Jim, Ken, and Liz, we pray for all those who are weighing on our hearts this day. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all evermore. Amen. And uh, a reminder before we uh, transition into our day's sermon, uh, that uh, your ongoing support of our food cupboard ministry is appreciated. There are volunteers here Mondays at 2 to 3 p.m., Wednesdays 7 to 8 p.m., and Friday mornings from 9 until 10 uh, for July. We're especially encouraging donations of pasta, canned meat and fish, and diapers that are size 1 and 2. So thank you to everyone for their support and involvement in our neighborhood ministry. And now we turn to Father Jerry for his message this day. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Not that long ago I re-watched The Da Vinci Code, which in my mind is a movie with very little connection to reality. But once you start watching it, you can't stop. It has also attracted cult-like followers who think that it is factual. And then came today's lessons, and frankly, my first thought was, ah, eh, meh, this is not going to be very interesting. But I kept coming back to Ephesians, and connections happened in my admittedly sometimes weird brain. There's much scholarly agreement that the author of Ephesians is not Paul, but a disciple of Paul who knew him well, and wrote this letter as a summary of Paul's thought and theology. Reading this passage several times, and then the entire letter, one thing became very clear. Behind everything in this passage and this letter is one simply accepted fact. There was a man, Jesus, in Palestine who had an itinerant ministry, was radical enough to be executed by religious and civil authorities, and was resurrected by God. 
Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection. Let's talk resurrection, I thought. And you'll have to trust me that there is a connection somewhere down the road coming, at least in my mind, to the Da Vinci Code. In a conversation with another cleric a while ago, he claimed many Christians found the theology of the resurrection difficult. And I want to pick some nit with that. I don't think it's the theology that is the problem. It's the fact of the resurrection that is difficult for some. Theologies or theories about the resurrection of Jesus abound. And many are just clever attempts to get around the fact that 20 centuries ago, a man was nailed to a cross, died, was buried, and after three days, his tomb was empty and he was seen by witnesses alive and well. It is this fact that is the center of Christianity. It is this fact that you have to accept if you call yourself a Christian. And there are many theors, theories and theologies to explain away the seeming impossibility of the fact of the resurrection, to diffuse it of its power, to make it acceptable, palatable, understandable. Well, let's deal with the many fraud theories first. The simplest suggests the 12 apostles who betrayed Jesus by running away simply made up the resurrection and pretended that his part was a part, that, sorry, that his death was a part of Jesus' plan. The tomb wasn't empty. The appearance of Jesus didn't happen. It was all a fraud. Then why didn't the temple authorities or Romans open the tomb, produce the body of Jesus, and end the deception and nuisance of this new religious movement? Wasn't it just to prevent such a fraud that guards were put on the tomb? A variant is that the tomb was empty, but it was the authorities who took the body, lest the disciples steal it and use it for their purposes. Again, if so, why not just produce the body when the followers of Jesus begin spreading their inconvenient news of resurrection? Ah, some say, but what if the disciples themselves stole the body and proclaimed the resurrection? At least a dozen or more people would have had to be a part of this conspiracy if it was fraud, and then all of the fraudsters were willing to die in unpleasant ways for it. Of all the twelve apostles, only John died in his bed. Of the other close followers of Jesus, not many died of old age. Most came to nasty ends, still protesting the truth of their message. Jesus, who died on the cross, had been raised from the dead for the forgiveness of sin and the redemption of the world. Given their behavior at the arrest of Jesus, when all ran away and one, Peter, even denied knowing Jesus three times, is it reasonable to believe not, not one of them would betray the fraud and save their life? There is the latest version of the fraud theory as described in Michael Bajan's book of a few years ago, The Jesus Papers, exposing the greatest cover-up in history. And here is the connection to the Da Vinci Code. I'll have to digress. If this name sounds familiar, it's because his earlier book, The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, is behind Dan Brown's novel and the movie. Bajan sued Brown for copyright violation. He lost. But this had the unintended consequences that both his books, Holy Blood and Jesus Papers, which is actually just a rework, became the most examined and debunked books of pseudo-history, leaving Pageant thoroughly discredited. And you thought biblical scholarship was dull. Well, moving along, the short version of this fraud story is that Pontius Pilate conspired with the followers of Jesus, whom he feared, and Pageant doesn't explain why, to have Jesus crucified to satisfy the temple authorities. And again, Pageant doesn't explain why, but in reality, Jesus was taken down from the cross alive, and then he was simply recovered. The entire theory is based on two Greek words used in the Gospel of Mark. Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate to request the soma, supposedly the living body of Jesus, and then later Pilate gives him the ptoma, the supposedly dead body of Jesus. Trouble is, both words in first century Greek were, like our own word, body, used interchangeably and could mean living or dead body. And Bajant cherry picks what he needs them to mean 
to suit his agenda. But, yeah, that was a digression. Again, if this fraud had occurred, why wasn't it revealed when there was a talk of a resurrection and the Jesus sect was becoming troublesome? There would need to be enough co-conspirators in a fraud of this magnitude, not just including Pilate, but the Roman officials. That sooner or later, oh yes, and the apostles would have to be in on it, wouldn't they? That sooner or later, somebody would have revealed it. Especially when some of the supposed conspirators, the followers of Jesus, as we've noted, were not the strongest and most resolute people, were being tortured and executed. And it, it's probably unchristian to emphasize again that in serious scholarly circles, even unbelieving scholarly circles, Michael Bajan has a lot of notoriety, but not much credibility. Okay, enough of fraud, it simply won't do. What about hallucination? The resurrection appearances of Jesus were hallucinations. If so, they were remarkably vivid and don't match hallucinations as psychologists have studied them. They also happened to different sets of people, alone or in groups, and not always the same people, and yet with a certain consistency. The Jesus that appeared on the Emmaus Road walked with two travelers, entered into discussion of scripture, and handled food. The disciples in Jerusalem met a Jesus that could be touched, ate fish, taught and empowered, and that all of those gathered out to Bethany a distance of some two miles. Thomas met a solid, touchable Jesus, and in John's Gospel, Jesus broils fish and eats with the disciples. Not your usual hallucination, psychologists tell us. And again, again, given what we know of the earlier intestinal fortitude of the disciples, it is, like, is it likely that even one, let alone all but one, would be willing to die a painful death for their hallucinations? Moving right along to the third class of theories, the spiritual resurrection. The disciples had spent so much time with Jesus, heard so much of his teaching, that after his death they lived the values of Jesus and felt he was present with them in a spiritual way. They could draw on their experiences of Jesus and in a sense have him present. Nice. But that really doesn't explain the bald declaration, we have seen the Lord. It doesn't explain the reported physical reality of Jesus with them, unless you accept both spirituality and fraud. And it especially doesn't explain how these illiterate fishers and farmers could suddenly proclaim a complex theological message of salvation by death and resurrection with their convincing power. And finally, again, it doesn't really explain the subsequent fate of the apostles. I'm fairly certain of myself that I wouldn't be prepared to die painfully for a vague spiritual non-resurrection. Well, enough. In philosophy and in science, there's a principle called Occam's Razor. Named after William of Occam, a 12th century Franciscan scholar, it has many forms, but in essence it says, don't think up a complex theory to explain something when a simple theory will do the job. Applying that principle to the resurrection and its many explanations suggests that perhaps the simplest explanation is to take the biblical account and subsequent history at face value. Jesus, who died, was resurrected on the third day after death. He appeared to his disciples in a physical and yet non-physical body and then went to be with God, sending the Holy Spirit to empower them to take the message of Jesus into the entire known world. Ah, you say, or maybe, okay, but I'd still like to know just exactly how Jesus was resurrected. What happened? Tell us what happened. I haven't the slightest idea. But unless you want your God, weak and docile, conforming to human expectations and subject to human physical theories, then God can resurrect anyone God pleases. For the God who created the universe and holds it in existence, 
the resurrection of Jesus to a body both physical and spiritual would not be difficult. And I don't need to know the mechanism of the resurrection because I have seen the Lord. And before you call the wagon and the guys in the white coats with the nets, let me explain. There have been a few times in my life, a very few times, when I have experienced a power beyond myself, a presence within me, a guide beside me, working in my present reality. It has been a real enough experience that I made a fairly drastic life change to follow the call of that power. I can come up with a whole load of explanations for my experience, and believe me, I tried, mostly so I could condore the call. But the simplest, remember Occam's phrase, and the simplest explanation is that I met the risen Christ. And if I might be so presumptuous, so have you. But else, why else are you here watching a service on a screen? Why else did you get up early on Sunday mornings when we could meet physically, struggle to get dressed, hastily eat breakfast, drive or walk to get to our building on time? Why are you going to do that again when we're able to reopen? Somewhere in your life, the risen Christ came to you in both a physical and spiritual way, and you were convinced enough by that encounter that here you are, like me, hoping to meet him again. Amen. <laughs>